record on this computer. Nailed it. Okay, so hello everybody. And as you know, most of you know me from Twitter, so I'm Ron Goth Sam on Twitter, so feel free to contact me there. Also, feel free to use the hashtag RomancingTheGothic if you're wanting to comment on this class, live tweet, connect with other people, um, and also follow things that I've put up in the past. This, this week, I think I shared some quite fun images, <laughs> so uh, do what you will with that. So today we're talking about who will rid me of this troublesome priest, Gothic faith and monstrous religion. I'm very excited about today and I'm excited that actually more people turned up than I was expecting. So you may or may not know that my specialism is um, the early British Gothic. So that's from 1764 to 1833. And also that my specialism is the theology of the Gothic, looking particularly at sort of Protestant theology, uh, differing Protestant theologies and the, and the early British Gothic. So this is really sort of um, the talk where most of my it's really getting into my actual research. So it's quite exciting for me and I'm hoping that you'll enjoy it. It's quite content heavy. I'm just going to warn you. So if you're finding, uh, uh, I couldn't process it quickly enough to ask a question, then very much feel free to contact me outside of class hours um, to ask a question if you, need, if you need to or you want to. Um, also, in previous weeks, I've concentrated on different time periods, but I'm really going to concentrate today on that early British Gothic period, as I say, up to about the 18, 1820s, 1830s. The three sections today, so if you've not been before, I do three sections and there's question times after each section. Um, and it's only that last question time, remember, that we can have video questions. But... Um, the first section is going to look at one of the most commonly discussed intersections of the religion and the Gothic in these early texts. The second section is going to sort of problematize and question some of our assumptions about the things I've talked about in the first part. And the third part is going to be very brief and it's just going to have a very quick look at some more of the, the ways in which the Gothic engages with ideas of Gothic faith and monstrous religion or monstrous theology. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to the to the actual start of the talk. So you may be aware that the Gothic is quite is replete, I would say, with monstrous monks, perfidious priests or perverse priests, and nefarious nuns. I did work at that. Um, and so I thought that we would start today by having a look at my top five. <laughs> now I've not included two by the same author, so you might find some of your favorites missing, um, but hopefully it's giving a little bit of an overview of some of these monstrous clergy that you find in the Gothic. So number five, I'm using the example of Father Hubert um, from T.J. Horsley Curtis's Ethelwina or the House of Fitzalban. And it's not perhaps a text that's very familiar to a lot of people. Um, it is actually very good, recommend. So T.J. Horsley Curtis has created here really a sort of terror gothic novel. The heroine Ethelwina is persecuted principally by her cousin, I think he is Leopold. She ends up being imprisoned, forced to marry him, etc, etc. Eventually she wins free, she marries the man of her dreams. Um, but what's Hubert got to do with it? Why is he so monstrous? Well, he enters the scene, wheedling his way into her house, um, with this sort of sob story about poverty and affliction, etc. And she takes him on as the household priest, but he betrays her because he is always open to a bribe. And he is bribed by Leopold, the iniquitous, um, into sort of performing this fake marriage ceremony. So Ethelwina is actually unconscious at this point. She, and she gets married to Leopold without her consent. Um, eventually Leopold's like, maybe that wasn't really a marriage, I guess, um, and tries to force her into a marriage while she is actually conscious this time. Um, and again, Hubert is on hand to help with that. And we find that he's actually conspired with Leopold in the kidnapping, forced marriage, pretend marriage, seduction and murder of, of more women um, while in the pay of Leopold. So that's our first monstrous clergyman. And as you can see, a little bit problematic, but pretty tame stuff compared to where we're going to be going with this. 
In number four, place number four, we have got more famously Scidoni or Scidoni from um, The Italian or The Confessional of the Black Penitents by Anne Radcliffe. So um, more of you, I think, will probably have read this book. I've talked about it or I've mentioned it before. You might have been familiar with the plot. But again, it's a fairly... Um, no, it's not bland at all. It is a, it is a terra gothic novel, though, which focuses on the young couple Elena and Vivaldi and the persecutions they undergo um, on the part of her, uh, his mother, who is in league with Father Scidoni against them. But before the novel even starts, before we have met Vivaldi and um, Elena, we have um, a, a prehistory of dark deeds for Scadoni. So he arranges the murder and death, his, the death of his brother in order to get his inheritance and his sister-in-law. He ends up raping her and forcibly marrying her and then in a fit of jealous rage attempts to kill her. So this is only the start. When we enter the story with Vivaldi and Elena, he's in league with the Marquesa, as I mentioned, to break them up, but not just through sort of rumors and gentle deceits, although he does do both of those things, including using sort of supernatural trickery. It's not real supernatural, it's pretend supernatural. Um, but he goes that step further and conspires to kidnap Elena, confine her to a convent, then re-kidnaps her. He also attempts to kill her, and he only doesn't kill her because he realizes that she's his, well, he thinks she's his daughter, but she's actually his niece. Um, and he obviously sends Vivaldi to the Inquisition. He himself eventually gets taken to the Inquisition when his Vivaldi plan backfires, and he ends up killing his confederate via the medium of poison and laughing maniacally at his death. <laughs> so quite dark here, and a real sort of, curve that ends on a high note of evil. So number three, I'm going to move to a female villain in this case. So in the Gothic, abbesses are quite often complicit with bad deeds. They will help you confine or imprison somebody in a, in a, in a convent. But this particular abbess, the Madre Vittoria Bracciano, in the abbess by w William H. Ireland, she goes that step further. So, in this story, again, the focus is a young couple, Marcello and Madalena. So, Mar Marcello or Marcello meets Madalena, well, doesn't meet her, he just sees her across the church, falls in love as you do. And the abbess is used to using Father Ubaldo to sort of, as a pimp, basically, to bring her young men for her sexual pleasures. Um, and she sends Father Ubaldo after Marcello. And he thinks, you know, when the priest says, hey, come with me, there's a lady who'd like to see you at the, at the nunnery. He's like, oh, that'll be the woman I love. And it isn't. So the Madre Vittoria, in order not to annoy her, he pretends that he might be interested in her, goes back, and then she drugs him and rapes him. So fairly horrendous. Um, when he, for some reason, doesn't fall in love with her after that, she maligns his love rival. She, she throws out these rumors, gets her confined by her father in this distant Gothic castle. Um, and she rules her convent itself, of course, with an iron rod. So we've got this mixture of her, her hypocrisy as well as her own lasciviousness and libidinousness. Um, and if you've got your microphone on, could you just turn it off for me? Thank you. Um, there's a bit of feedback from somebody. Um, let me see. I can mute everyone if you're struggling. There we go. Okay, um, so she's got this, uh, she hypocritically rules, lascivious, blah, blah, blah. Um, and she also ends up sending both of her, the protagonist, to the Inquisition. But she's not just sort of distantly doing this, she's really into it. And we see her um, going, for example, and presiding over or participating, well, not participating in, but being um, present at the very vividly described torture scenes. So a fairly monstrous nun here. Number two uh, is a familiar character if you've been to any of my classes. And you couldn't really leave him off, Ambrosio, because he makes a pact with the devil, doesn't he? Um, obviously, as we know, he starts off with his spiritual pride and his lack of mercy. He refuses aid to the young nun Agnes, of course, um, 
and it condemns her to this basically imprisonment and the death of her child. Starts off light with this unhealthy obsession with his Virgin Mary painting and then the devil gets involved. He sends a, a minor demon disguised as uh, a, a novice, um, Rosario, and obviously there's some kind of queer transgressive tension going on there, but it's erased. Worry not, everyone's straight here. Um, because it turns out that Rosario is actually Matilda. Um, and as we've seen in a lot of uh, the illustrations of Matilda, there's this emphasis on um, getting her boobs out, just to show, just to show. And uh, nothing queer going on here. Um, he gets bored of her because she's not, she's too into the sex um, and he wants somebody more sort of innocent and good and pure. So he gets into this girl called Antonia. He makes some magical deals, including a deal with Satan for a magic creeper myrtle so that he can touch a wall and walk through it. Um, and he ends up through that process, as we see in the picture, killing his mother, ends up kidnapping and raping his sister because we find out that Antonia is his sister. Surprise. Um, obviously ends up killing her and finishes his career by signing a binding demonic pact with the devil. So. Fairly hardcore stuff going on there. Now, I said I wasn't going to include um, the same two characters from the same author, but I do have to give an honorable mention to a sort of monstrous clergy person in the form of Rosario Matilda, because they are, in fact, a demon. So I feel that counts. Uh, also, a demonstration of my point about the depiction of Matilda there. So, number one. Who is it? Now, if you have been listening along this week to our readings, you will know who it is. It is Father Jerome from The Libertines, which is an anonymously authored text. Um, and he is in my top number one place because even though he doesn't sign a demonic pact, he does have some dealings with black magic or he wants to have some dealings with black magic. But the sheer number of crimes he commits is what got him the top spot. So let me go through very quickly a few of these key crimes. We start strong, opening the novel with him planning a murder, which he doesn't commit actually, so. Hmm. Um, but then we learn his backstory. He abandoned his wife or common law wife and daughter. And when he meets his daughter again, he tries to seduce her, not realizing she's his daughter. She stabs him though, so escape. He kidnaps various women throughout the course of the text. He rapes various women. He imprisons various women. He kills various women and men. He also does sort of more mundane things like teaming up with Alexo, who's our protagonist's uncle, to disinherit Alexo by forcing him into a monastery. He also does really random things. Um, my motto for the book is, it's always Father Jerome. Um, so once Alexo escapes, he teams up with a Jew, but it's not a Jew, it's Father Jerome, and he's actually running a bandit ring full of murder and robbery. Um, he precipitates the suicide of Father Francis, who is Alexo's mentor. He uses the Inquisition as his personal vengeance machine. Like, he's always just like, no, I take them to the Inquisition. Um, and he does this to his confederates, so to Caras and um, Bissare. He just sends them to the Inquisition and they have to kill themselves the same day. He forces De Caras to drink poison and Bessari chooses to die uh, on a, with a dagger. He has a really weird ending, so spoiler alert if you've been watching along, but this is very tacked on at the end, so don't worry, I'm not spoiling major plot points. He becomes a field preacher, um, a sort of Methodisty field preacher, randomly but kind of continues his slightly controlling ways by getting everybody to convert to, um, to recant from the Catholic Church and convert. And in doing so, he makes them all heretics and he himself dies a heretic in the flames. So, a couple of terrible clergy there. And you can see that it's a major theme in the Gothic. And one thing that you will have probably noticed is that all of these clergy are Catholic. So, the idea that the, the early British Gothic is anti-Catholic is fairly widespread in criticism. Um, there's a critic called Diamond Hoibel, or there was, who goes so far in her book, The Gothic Ideology, suggests that the Gothic ideology is anti-Catholicism. Now, I quite strongly disagree with this, but we are going to investigate the anti-Catholic elements in the text. And then in the second part, I'm going to provide a bit of nuance and historicization, and I'm going to argue, basically. 
But <clears throat> the first thing that I want to, to talk about is the way in which um, the Gothic borrows and builds on an existing tradition of anti-clerical pornographic works. Um, so this is particularly within the French context. Um, you have it throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. They're anti-clerical and they're anti-Catholic. And, and then you have a resurgence again in the late 18th century, particularly around the period of the French Revolution. And these are texts, erotic texts usually, um, that depict the convent and the monastery as sites of sexual transgression. And I think you can see some of the pictures in the background there. Um, one of them made me laugh a lot. <laughs> the other one is just badly drawn, I think. Um, but let me give you a few examples. One of them is The Unmasking of All Popish Monks, Friars and Jesuits by Owen Lewis from 1628. And I'm just going to read to you what he says here about Catholics because it's quite a good um, indication of what these texts had in them and what the charges were. So he says, what is their lives but pharisaical, injurious, lascivious, lecherous and sodomitical? They talk of heaven, but they walk not to heaven. They brag of chastity, but they keep concubines or else do much worse. They defile themselves one with another. They speak of justification by good works, but they have no good works. But vice, sodomy, adultery, fornication, fraud, tyranny, ambition, covetousness, and all uncharitableness. They talk of Christ, but have no Christ. So... As you can see, um, there's this particular idea of Catholics and Catholicism coming through here, and it is often linked to sexual sin, something that we kept seeing in those earlier examples I gave you. Some other examples of this are, for example, uh, The Venus in the Cloister, which is a fictional work. It's part of the sort of prostitute dialogue genre, but it's two nuns, the older one initiating the younger one in the secrets of sexual intercourse, etc. Um, Antonio Gavin is credited as the writer of a couple of different works, including The Frauds of the Romish Monks, which purports to be a series of letters on his travels through Naples, and then he did one on travels through Italy. You also have the master key to popery, and um, there's a picture here of the title page. You can see part four, um, the revelations of three nuns. So this idea of people from within convents providing these autobiographical narratives of the iniquities that take place in them. And that's something that you're still finding in the 19th century, if you're aware of the Mariah Monk narrative, which was a bit of a sensation, for example. Um, the last example I've given you, just to show how popular these works continued to be in the 18th century, is um, attributed to Jean-Charles Latouche, but um, in not quite clear. The history of Dom Bougeret, I don't know how to speak French, apologies. And um, this was republished, re reprinted, had new editions all through the 18th century. And it's the tale of the Porter of Chartreux, and it's a piece of erotica, basically. And one of the pictures in the background is taken from it. So you have this history of pornographic anti clericalism, and you certainly find that being echoed in these Gothic scenes of sexual depravity. Um, connected to monstrous clergy. Now a really interesting um, sort of midpoint between these two things I would say to showing that interconnection is the work of the Marquis de Sade and specifically Justine or the Misfortunes of Virtue. So it's not technically a gothic text, he certainly wouldn't have thought of it as gothic because for the Marquis de Sade um, the gothic always had to have elements of the supernatural and the fantastic but um, it certainly has a number, I would say, of fairly gothic tropes. The heroine in peril, the constant persecution and threat, um, the curiosity, the attempt to repel, um, lechery, are all sort of very gothic frames. And there's some very gothic scenes, including the one I'm going to talk about with uh, the monks. It is technically a libertine novel, so the libertine literature of the 18th and 19th centuries, and particularly, obviously, Desaad is working within the French tradition at the end of the 18th century. You have um, this emphasis on sexual transgression, um, philosophical sort of atheism, and um, anti-clericalism, anti-Catholicism, anti-religion, atheism. Um, 
this you might be more familiar with some of his more provocative works such as 120 days of sodom and provocative isn't the right word downright disturbing books um they i mean the 120 days of sodom is basically just a litany of abuse and it doesn't have much of a plot but um justine is a novel with a plot and it's basically a sentimental novel gone wrong so it's about two sisters, Justine and Juliet. Juliet takes the easy road out of poverty and becomes a prostitute. Justine refuses to give up her virtue, but ends up through that um, getting increasingly sucked into a life of crime and pain and horror. And she ends up um, sort of accidentally committing a lot of atrocious acts. So she accidentally throws a baby in a fire. She accidentally burns 21 people to death as she escapes prison. She accidentally ends up sort of guilty in the murder of somebody's mother. The scene that's really connecting that gothic and uh, that pornographic anti-clericalism and the gothic, I think, is the, the scene where she enters a monastery. So she's looking for shelter. The monks fool her and take her in. And eventually she basically becomes um, a sexual slave in, in the monastery. Um, so you've got that clear anti-clericalism, but you've got it within this fairly gothic uh, sort of framework of a narrative. And there's certainly really useful and interesting interconnections between this novel and the work of Desaad and Gothic writers, such as Matthew Lewis, particularly. So Matthew Lewis is known to have had a knowledge, a working knowledge of um, French erotic anti-clericalism and the work of Desaad. And Desaad also is fairly complimentary about Matthew Lewis as the monk. Um, so you definitely see this sense of interconnection and borrowing between the two novels, and particularly in that depiction of sexual excess that you get in um, Matthew Lewis's work. So I'm going to, even before the second section, I'm going to throw in a little bit of a caution. So we're talking about all of these depictions of sort of clerical monsters and talking about them as Catholics, and they are Catholic within the text. But one of the, the most famous pieces of criticism, most commonplace pieces of criticism about the Gothic is the way in which particularly these early Gothic texts take contemporary concerns and throw them into the past at a safe distance. So if you're thinking about the 1790s, you have these concerns about um, tyranny and autocratic rule, but also about mob rule and um, the unleashing of the mob. And you're finding these themes being cast back in time to the medieval and early modern periods depicted in most of these Gothic texts, in your tyrannical lords, for example. Um, and I would argue that we also see this in terms of the church. So the depiction of the Catholic church and the anxieties that it demonstrates about the iniquity within the Catholic church is also a shadow or a reflection of um, existing concerns about the church in England, specifically the Anglican church. So the poem that I am using here to demonstrate the way in which this kind of critique of Catholicism and critique of Anglican clerics or even dissenting clerics are, are, are being compared is The Times by Charles Churchill. So this is only a tiny portion of it. It's a very a uh, homophobic poem full of the tropes. Um, it's on Richter Norton's website about uh, homosexuality in the 18th century, which is a great resource if you've not found it before. Um, but as you can see here, um, he is basically the whole poem is about how the Italians have made us gay. They've come, they've gayed us up. No! Um, and <laughs> it's also connected, of course, with this sort of Catholicism. Um, so the first part there is advice to a father. So give him, give your son, no tutor, but throw him to a punk. Um, a punk was a period appropriate term for a prostitute. Rather than trust his morals to a monk. Monks we all know, we who have lived at home from fair report and travellers who roam more feelingly. Nor trust him to the gown. Tis oft a covering in this vile town for base designs. Ourselves have lived to see more than one parson in the pillory. So here I've underlined it, well, I put it in bold just to really make my point. You have this comparison between the monk and the parson, between the Catholic and the Anglican clergy, both engaged in the exact same forms of hypocritical iniquity. You also, in that second part, have this idea that um, British 
the clergy are failing their congregations by not tackling the sin of sodomy head on. He says, loud against all other crimes, is silent here and thinks himself absolved in the pretense of decency, which meant for the defense of real virtue and to raise her price, becomes an agent for the cause of vice. So here he's saying, basically, you know, you're not talking about this, about sodomy, because you're saying, oh, no, it would hurt the delicate female ears. It would it would cause people to think about doing the sin. Um, but in doing this, you're not giving out the warning that people need to hear. So that's one example. You've also got throughout the 18th century growing critiques and concerns with the Anglican Church, um, as you do in each century, to be honest with you. But you have this dissatisfaction, which is manifest, very manifest in the evangelical revival that you have in the 1740s and 40s with the rise of Methodism, Wesleyan Methodism and Calvinist Methodism in uh, Wales. You've also got other religious denominations starting in the 18th century, which were very critical of the Anglican Church, including, for example, the Unitarians, who um, started their church in 1787, I think, the first official one, form of rational, um, politically radical dissent. This idea of the problem of British clergy is made quite clear, for example, in the general dissenting text of Isaac Watts, a humble at a, at attempt towards the revival of practical religion. He talks about the hypocrisy of divines, both Anglican and dissenting, who did not practice the imitation of Christ. So this depiction of monstrous clergy expresses anxieties more generally about clergy of all denominations. It's all about not just individuals here, but there are systemic problems within um, the church. There's the problem of sinecures, of nepotism, of non-residence in parishes, and the rigid, rigid parochial structures, which basically meant that parochial borders were not changing with the times. So these um, tiny villages that had become thriving industrial towns hadn't had the number of churches or the provision of priests, uh, provision of vicars uh, raised, for example. So another critic that is very useful in this, and I highly recommend his article or his edited, uh, his chapter in an edited collection is Robert Miles on Europhobia. And he notes that the Catholic body in the Gothic is often the shadow of Protestantism. So he says enthusiastical Protestantism, but I think we can widen it out. So that's just a little bit of a caveat to bear in mind. But let's go back to this idea of a monstrous Catholicism. And what's what are some of the critiques that are being raised? What's the historical context here of anti-Catholicism in the 18th century? I'm going to talk briefly about anti-Catholic rhetoric and the idea of Catholicism as a threat. So you do certainly have, as many critics have noted, a resistance to the expansion of the legal rights of Catholics in the 18th centuries, which were circumscribed by such acts as the Test and Corporation Act, which barred um, Catholics from various sort of social positions and social rights, social and political rights. Um, this is the idea that the 1780 Gordon riots, which were a response to the 1778 expansion of Catholic rights, are an example of the anti-Catholic uh, feeling of the time. And the Gordon riots, if you're not aware of them, they're connected to Lord George Gordon, but they were a working class set of riots where multiple people died and it lasted for a long time. It was excessive. So a lot of this rhetoric and fear is connected to the idea of the Catholic Church as a persecuting church. That is the idea that the Catholic Church is a church which um, is closed. So if you're not in the Catholic Church, you're not saved, you're not a Christian, you're not, you're, you're a heretic, basically. And the idea that once you're outside of that Catholic Church, you are open to persecution, um, and either to be absorbed or eradicated. So a little caveat here, and it's gonna be true for the rest of my talk today. When I talk about Catholic theology, I am very specifically talking about the Protestant conception of Catholic theology in the period. It's a little note. Um, there's this rhetoric about the Catholic Church as the Antichrist or the Whore of Babylon, as we can see in the picture there. Um, and you're finding this throughout the 18th century. It's a, it's a Reformation rhetoric, but <coughs> you're continuing to see it even up into the 19th century very clearly so um, the example that I've put at the bottom is Charles Maturin's you'll see it in a second is Charles Maturin's five sermons 
Um, and he has a whole such old Charles Maturin, author of Melmoth, the Wanderer Gothic novel. He has um, one sermon of those five is called Babylon is Fallen, in which um, the Catholic Church itself is pictured as the whore of Babylon, full of the names of blasphemy. You have this, this is all connected to the idea of the Catholic Church as a threat, the Catholic institution. And it is worth here noting the difference between, particularly in the writings of somebody like Maturin, Catholics and how he thinks about individual Catholics and the Catholic Church. But this idea of the Catholic Church as a political entity, which is a threat to the security of the state and security to the fundamental social structures. Um, so this is linked to sort of historical events. If you're not very clear on the history of the 17th and 18th centuries, some key, key dates here. Um, so 1688 was the Glorious Revolution, when Britain or England really defined itself as a Protestant country by saying that only a Protestant could rule. So James II was deposed and they invited William and Mary of Orange, two Protestants, to rule. Now, there were various rebellions in order to try and reestablish the true line. Um, and these were known as the Jacobite rebellions in 1715 and 1745, particularly. And they're connected with the idea of Catholicism because there was a high degree of Catholic support and also support from um, Catholic countries such as France at the time. You also have events such as the gunpowder plot, which we're all familiar with for bonfire night that um, Guy Fawkes attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament. It was a Catholic plot, of course. And the Popish plot, and I've popped it in inverted commas because this never happened. It was a made up plot, it was a hysteria. This guy called Titus Oates made it up. Um, but there's not only the sort of memory and idea of this Catholic threat, but also a memorialization of it in the public consciousness. So for example, every year there was a, um, a sermon to give thanks that the gunpowder plot failed. And that's well into the 18th century, even I think into the beginning of the 19th century that remained in the book, um, the Anglican prayer cycle. Another sort of aspect of this is the impact of the French Revolution and the influx of Catholic refugees from France. And you have, for example, the 1793 Aliens Act. So the French Revolution started off in 1789 and the terror really kicked in in 1793-94. In 1793, the Aliens Act was passed, which reduced the number of immigrant, it reduced immigration numbers, basically. And you can certainly link this to a sense of anti-Catholicism, as well as a more general sense of sort of xenophobia, and a fear of the radical politics of France infecting England as well. So that's the, the set of sermons that I mentioned by Charles Maturin. So we've talked about there really this idea of the threat of the Catholic Church as a political entity. And I'm going to move on to some of the more internal critiques of Catholicism and how it posed a threat, um, not as a political entity, but how it posed a threat to individuals, individual families and through them the nation. So there's this idea of the dangers of the confessionals, which gives the Catholic priest specific access and influence over um, his parishioners. It's also um, connected to some of the worries surrounding Catholicism of the, the idea that in Catholicism, your uh, ultimate allegiance is to the Pope, not the King. So there's this sense of the, the idea of these Catholic figures, whether it's the Pope or your parish priest, um, having influence on you that separates you from your national identity, from your place in society, so that you're always made another. So Diane Heuveler, Diane Long Heuveler, has talked about um, this idea of the dangers of the confessional as one of the key points of anti-Catholicism, that through the confessional, priests had access to the inner thoughts and desires of their parishioners, giving the clergy the power to control females in ways that were viewed as dangerous to the control that women should be under, from their fathers and husbands. Hmm. So Heuveler is looking at this through a gender perspective, but I think we can also apply this, and you'll see in one of my examples in a second, to men. Um, so this idea that this control isn't just limited to women, but it's this dangerous form of influence and control over Catholic parishioners. So the confessional. Doesn't seem like it could be that bad. You're just telling them a few secrets. Uh, getting a few bits of penance. So what's the worst that could happen? Really, it can't be that bad. It can. 
Um, so, in Anne Radcliffe's The Italian, we have an example of where, how the confessional can go wrong. So you have um, the Marchesa di Vivaldi and Scidoni, the evil priest monk guy, and he is her private confessor. And what's the worst that could happen is that together they um, enter into a conspiracy of kidnap and murder of poor Elena. Um, there's also this sense in which, as Diane Long Heuveler hints at, there's this family breakdown and the priest takes the place of the husband or father as the key point of influence on the Marchesa. There's also an alternative reading which is quite useful, I think, here. So there's this sense of the way in which the Catholic priest, as avatar of the Catholic Church, disrupts the societal structures of a Protestant England. But there's also, I think, and George Haggerty points this out, a really interesting fear of the codependence um, of the state and the church and the way that they work together to foment oppression. And you see that definitely in the relationship of Scudoni and the Marchesa di Vivaldi, who are basically sort of codependent and make each other worse. Um, the second example is from Melmoth the Wanderer and the inset tale of the Spaniard Monthala. So again, you have a, a, a private family priest having excessive influence over a family, and not in this case just the mother, but also the father. So the, the secret is that Moncada is not actually a, a legitimate son. He was conceived illegitimately by his two parents. And the priest uses this knowledge to manipulate them, also to get money out of them, but he uses the threat of damnation to make them give their son to the convent. Um, having done so, of course, he um, forces him into a monastic life and ends up basically torturing him or letting Monkhada or making Monkhada be tortured. Also leads inevitably to the murder of the younger son. So as you can see, there are some problems here um, with the confessional and the Gothic really explores those fears. Um, so let me just pop my gif up. Oh, oh. That's what's the worst that could happen. Next gif. Um, this is another trope that I'm going to talk about here because we've looked at the way in which the Catholic Church as an entity um, and the priest as an avatar of the Catholic Church as an entity represents a threat. But the Gothic also explores this motif of the persecutor persecuted, the way in which um, the Catholic Church's theologies rebound on the individual. Um, and you can see here um, an example from the Da Vinci Code, a terrible reference perhaps, but this idea of the, the self-flagellating um, religious figure. But you have this idea of the persecution of the persecuted, that though they're engaged in this um, dangerous activity, garnering temporal power for themselves, uh, being evil all over the shop, they're also being persecuted as individuals by the, Catholic, by the theological tenets of the Catholic faith. And you find some quite detailed theological critique going on in the Gothic. So brace, 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 this is the really nerdy bit. Um, so what's going on in the Italian then? What are we seeing in this depiction of Scidoni? What is the persecutor persecuted issue that's going on here? Well, there is a frame for the novel of the confessional and a connected idea of penitential theology. So the subtitle is The Confessional of the Black Penitents. So it's fairly obvious there, confessional penitents. Um, but it's also framing the novel. So the frame narrative of the Italian is a couple sort of bob to a church. They're going on a guided tour. And the guide is like, oh, look over there. Do you see that confessional? There was this proper juicy confession. Um, so that's the opening and the whole sort of story of the book leads you up to the last scene where you finally find out what that confession was. So the, the story is bookended by this motif of the confessional and it becomes really the target of theological critique, particularly in relation to the depiction of Scidoni. So what's the problem that Protestants had in this period with a penitential theology? So we can look to Maturin here quite usefully. He discusses um, the sacrament of penance. He connects it to the confessional and the idea of priestly absolution of sin. 
He calls it this monstrous doctrine, which notoriously substitutes the phrase do penance for the repent ye. So he's comparing here the ideas of repentance and penance. The doctrine of penance replaces internal revolution and rejection of sin, which is understood by repentance, with the ideal or idea of an external penance or price. So instead of this internal revolution turning away, repenting of our sins, there is instead this idea of you, you do penance for your sins. So you pay an external price um, to sort of buy off your sins. And we see clearly um, Skidoni engaged in this penitential theology. We're told that he's seeking absolution through penance because he's frequently engaged in rigorous penance, which um, can quite easily be imagined to be the self-flagellation that you saw in the last video. Um, and we're told that specifically linked people associate it with the idea of the consequences of a hideous crime gnawing upon an awakened conscience. So there's this idea that there's certainly guilt but there isn't repentance because he can't repent. He doesn't know he needs to repent. He thinks in, in terms of the doctrine of penance, not of repentance. And you certainly see the failure of this doctrine of penitence um, by the end of the novel, because there's a scene in it, which Mariah Pers, for example, says is a scene of repentance where he's going to kill his daughter and then he doesn't. And it's like, yes, he's been saved. He hasn't though. He just doesn't kill her because he's like, oh man, she's my daughter? Sweet. When she marries Vivaldi, I'll have even more power and influence. So that's why he stops. Um, and certainly he ends the novel with that sort of the death of his confederate and that demoniacal sound of exultation that he has, which is a, the best sort of um, evidence of a repentant character. I'm just going to quote myself here. But his penitential practice is therefore not only revealed as fruitless, but in accordance with Maturin's claims, a deadly delusion that bars the way to salvation by replacing an awareness of the need for repentance with a system of barter, disassociated from, from any internal revolution. Skidoni is both oppressor and victim within the Catholic system, winning temporal power and separated by doctrine rather than simply by his own iniquity from salvation. So what gets in the way isn't only his sin, but his doctrine that makes him incapable of seeking repentance because he is continually seeking penance. So you have the theological critique here, um, but I'm going to move back to now a sort of more, well, no, we're still in theological critique, but we're moving on to a different form of Catholic portrayal. So not necessarily um, specific monks, nuns, abbots, etc. It's the depiction of the convent and the monastery. So again, we're finding this a site of critique of Catholicism. Often in the Gothic, the, particularly the convent appears as a potential place of safety and security, a place free of men um, and free of persecution. You have this idea of get thee to a nunnery, but also please just run right back out because these conventual spaces almost always turn out to still be threatening. And we'll talk in the next slide about those that aren't. So let me give you a couple of examples. There is um, a Sicilian romance, Radcliffe's second novel. And in it, the beautiful Julia flees from her father, who's trying to make her marry an old, old guy. And she flees to a convent, which is contiguous to a monastery and ruled by an abbot somehow. And she's like, yes, I'm safe here. But he is convinced to hand her back over so she can't escape from the patriarchal structures of oppression into religion we find there is no escape another example of course of the bad convent is found in Anne Radcliffe's the Italian now as I'll discuss in the second part there are two convents that are contrasted here but the San Stefano where Elena is imprisoned is seen as this place obviously of confinement and imprisonment uh, an example of a fairly extremely terrible monastery and convent is, of course, the Libertines, um, where it is Father Jerome's kill zone, so not great. And also the Abbess by William H. Ireland. So as I mentioned before, you have this sense of the, the rigours of the institution, the hypocritical rigour, but also of the convent as a scene of iniquity, lasciviousness, luxury. Um, in the sort of the old sense of lustiness. 
You also have more theologically based critiques of the convent and of the theology which underlines conventual theology, theologies of isolationism and celibacy, for example. And there is a continually recurring theme in these Gothic novels that even when our characters flee to monasteries uh, or convents and they find their good nuns, um, they're safe there, that there's still a critique going on based on these theological principles or theological critiques of monasticism. So some of these critiques are the idea of the vow of celibacy as unnatural and vitiating, leading on to further sin. The idea of the cloistral separation from a secular life as a cowardly retreat from the world and productive of only negative virtue, of passive virtue. There's no sense of an active life of virtue and it's only, you're only good because you've avoided temptation. There's also an emphasis on legalistic practices producing hypocrisy and of course on the idea of the monastery or convent as a space in which the, temp the church attempts to usurp your riches and power. So let's have a quick look at some examples from a novel of how these criticisms appear and I've taken two examples from the same book and that is um, Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho. So in The Mysteries of Udolpho, Emily, after the death of her father, spends some time with a group of nuns who are, are very kind to her, very welcoming. There's nothing negative really said about them at the time. But she notes that they have spread a beautiful illusion over the sanctified retirement of a nun that almost hid from her view the selfishness of its security. So there's this idea, this emphasis on the negative and passive virtue of a convent and this lack of active virtue, this lack of engaging with the world, with temptation and with your duty. Then you have another character from the same novel, Blanche, who was raised in a convent because her dad was like, whatever, girl, child, what do I do with her? Um, to the convent. And she, when she leaves, finally says, I have been shut in a cloister from the view of these beautiful appearances which were designed to enchant all eyes and awaken all hearts. How can the poor nuns and friars feel the full fervour of devotion if they never see the sun rise or set? So there's this idea, of course, of there's a fundamental incoherence to monastic life because it separates you from the world that God created. It separates you from the world in which he reveals himself. And it's a form of pure revealed religion, which is just... Um, revealed religion being um, sort of about tradition and the revelation of the Bible, for example, and it's only revealed, there's no connection to the natural religion of God's self-revelation in the world. You're separate from part of faith itself if you're stuck in a monastery. So I'm going to round up this section with a focus on one other site of critique of Catholicism in the early British Gothic. It's the most famous one and you've probably been waiting for it and I do have so many different pictures for this one so I hope you enjoy might be the wrong word but I'm going to use it anyway, enjoy them. The Inquisition! So the horrors of the Inquisition is a repeated theme in the Gothic, comes about again and again and again. It's a fairly standard trope at this point of Gothic literature. Um, and so, because it's so frequent, I'm going to give you a top five list of some of my favourite depictions of what I think are the most horrifying depictions of the Inquisition. So the first one is fairly, fairly tame. St. Leon by William Godwin. St. Leon and William Godwin is a Rosicrucian, that is, he has found the secret to eternal life and eternal riches. He has the Philosopher's Stone and he has the Elixir Vitae. And the Catholic Church isn't really down with that. So he gets popped in the Inquisition and he has some of the, the sort of usual encounters, the questioning, etc. But he's not really tortured. He's just left there for 15 years in a room. So it's a bit tame, really. He's immortal. What's 15 years, you know? Anne Radcliffe, the Italian, is a masterclass in how to create tension um, and how to use the focalization through the victim's eyes because she keeps us completely in Vivaldi's perspective. We are trapped with him along these dark corridors where everything is obscure and confused and we're lost and we don't know where we are. And there's these cries and these noises that can't be interpreted. So it's this really sort of creeping tension that you get there. Valperga by Mary Shelley, a couple of different characters uh, end up in the Inquisition, particularly Beatrice. Um, and we're, it's, Usually it's a fairly standard depiction, but then you have these really evocative 
almost side notes about the tortures of the Inquisition, including like the burning of the feet, for example. So it's fairly horrifying. The Libertines obviously gets mentioned at all points because it's as a, it's a, just another of Jerome's kill zones. Anything can happen in the Inquisition in the Libertines. Everything does happen in the Inquisition. It's really the most unrealistic of them, um, but it's very going very over the top. Um, the last one. Well, can you guys hear me? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, the last one, and probably one of the most vicious, is the Abbess by William H. Ireland. So why is this in the top spot? Well, it's because it features these very detailed torture scenes and torture fantasies. So some of these torture fantasies are fairly sort of eroticized. Um, so Marcello imagines Madalena being tortured on the rack and all of her white limbs being bound, etc. But there's also just these grotesque depictions of torture of both of the main characters, including, for example, the image of um, Marcello um, having all of his limbs disjointed and then just obviously flopping around. It's pretty horrendous. So the Inquisition is a fairly common trope to the extent that I can have a top five horrifying depictions. If you're gonna write an Inquisition scene, I can give you some top tips from the early British Gothic. How do you write one? Well, you need to create an appropriate, appropriate atmosphere. Look to Radcliffe for this. You want some dark tunnels, you want some unidentified noises, you want a squalid cell, probably some straw on the floor. If you can find some bones under the floor, even better. You're going to want to start your prisoner's trial with some questions in front of um, a panel of inquisitors. Now, if you're going sort of full steam ahead like the Libertines, you will have your persecutor, the accuser, on that panel. Not necessarily very historically accurate. <laughs> um, you're going to have uh, no allegation given, no clue given as to the crime, and the prisoner is assumed guilty. The inquisitors will then have to threaten the prisoner with being put to the question or tortured but it won't happen right now usually you'll just send them to their room to stew and send an inquisition spy to them to try and coax out the secret by pretending to be his friend to be like oh hello i too am a prisoner of the inquisition why don't you tell me all of your sins basically uh, never works obviously in the gothic to increase the psychological terror, you might want to go for one of the Inquisition's techniques of producing this kind of demonic show using paintings, phosphorus, etc., to try and trick and terrify your victim into confession. Then you're going to go for the second questioning of the prisoner. And you can go two directions here, dark or light. If you're going to go dark, a la the abbess, just straight up torture them. If you're going to go light, you're going to have a key witness appearing and they are going to flip the accusation on your accuser and it's all gonna turn into a trial of your accuser. Then you can have three methods by which your protagonist can escape from the Inquisition. Number one, they can escape, literally, as St. Leon does. Um, my favorite version of that, by the way, is in St. Godwin, which is a parody of St. Leon, in which he just tells them that a demon plucked him up and replaced him, replaced the prisoner with him in that cell. So yes, it, it, I was just dropped here by a demon. I haven't been here for 15 years. You should let me go. And they totally do. Um, the other option is victory. So you, you win, your accuser is the one who ends up dying, or a sad option here from the Libertines, you might just die. Um, so the Inquisition is also tied to a number of very clear critiques of the Inquisitional um, justice. St. Leon by William Godwin offers a fairly kind of just detailed list, so I'll use it um, as my description. St. Leon calls it a mockery of a trial. He complains about the anonymity of the accusation, that anybody can accuse you without really much evidence, that there's a refusal to state a charge clearly and that manipulative questions are used to try and trick you into answering and condemning yourself. There's the baseness of the agents coming in, the spies and trying to trick you into confession. And I think this is probably my phrasing here, the barbarity and inefficacy of the mortification of the flesh to impact the beliefs of the victim. Or in other words, torture don't work. <laughs> so you've got all of these critiques of the, in of the Inquisition as an institution appearing here. Um, and Diane Long-Hoyvela suggests that what you're finding is this 
depiction of the Inquisition, a condemnation of a specifically Catholic legal and political and religious sort of organization of injustice contrasted with the British legal system. It's not something I can agree with really, unfortunately. And I'll go into that more in the second part, but it's worth noting that these exact critiques are part of a much wider critique about torture, for example, in the 18th and 17th, 17th and 18th centuries, often being produced by dissenting clerics in um, sort of relation to the Anglican church's oppression of dissenters. So these arguments are appearing in the English context, not related to the Inquisition at all. Um, and I think you're finding that echoing in, in uh, William Godwin particularly, but also more widely. But as I say, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the second session. Anyway, that's the end and of the end of the first part. You're not free yet. And it's time for the Spanish Inquisition. So time to put me to the question and I will stop sharing so that you can ask me some questions if you want to. Um, so hello, everybody. Would you like to ask me any questions? In the um, anti-Catholic oh. attitude, sorry. Um, sorry, if you can, can you put your questions in the chat for this, for this chat? Um, and then I will, do, I will do audio questions right at the end, just because it takes more time when it's, when it's um, audio questions. Um. <sighs> Um, hey Mason, uh, is that a question? <laughs> Not quite sure. Um, yes, I, I, I'm getting a bit sort of, oh, you were talking while I was talking, that's fine. Um, does anybody, I mean, that question that somebody was asking me, if you just write it down for me, if you can, um, does anybody else have um, a question? Were there questions that I missed that you've been asking in the middle? Okay, bloop, bloop, bloop. let me see. Um. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not an expert in the history of the Inquisition. Um, so in terms of some of the major, major historical inaccuracies include the timing of the Inquisition. So you're looking at the diminution of the activity of the Inquisition and how it works changes, of course, over time as well. Whereas in the Gothic, the Inquisition is a fairly ubiquitous object in Italy and Spain and France. Um, and it never, there's never any sort of mode of change in the terms of the way that these tribunals work or accusations work. There's no emphasis really on the historical context. And things like um, uh, the type of crimes that were more commonly dealt with by the Inquisition are, are relatively infrequently um, shown by the Gothic. So there's a lot of sort of lust that gets punished by the Inquisition. Um, rather than sort of these uh, crimes of heresy or um, used as a mo motive of state control. You don't really have the investigation of the ways in which the Catholic was used as a form of um, religious anti-Semitic oppression, for example, or racial oppression, etc. Um, in terms of the actual depiction of the workings of the Inquisition, it, I mean, it's a slightly difficult question, of course, because of the secrecy. But most of these accounts are being based on eyewitness accounts that were very popular and widely disseminated, particularly in the late 17th and early 18th century, sort of real life accounts from people who had been in the Inquisition. So they're, they're sort of based on these basic tropes that are coming out of true fact narratives, if that's any help or answer to that question. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Okay. Um, is their anti-Catholic attitude the same in all parts of the UK? No, I would say not. So one of the things we've been talking about all day, and the morning chat was really interesting for this because we had a, a specialist sort of in the Welsh Gothic here, um, is that there's very different religious and theological contexts in different parts of the UK, and you definitely find different concerns and different interactions with Catholicism with religious denominations more generally. So in a lot of your Irish Gothic texts as well, there's, um, 
there's a more nuanced depiction of the Catholic because obviously you're talking about people coming from a majority Catholic country, even when they're Protestant. So works like Regina Marie Roche's um, The Children of the Abbey have often been read as pro-Catholic. Now, I don't think they are pro-Catholic, but they are more, they're definitely pro-toleration. Um, so you definitely get a different aspect there. The Scottish Gothic that I've read, there's not much interaction with um, Catholicism so much as sort of really detailed theological interaction with um, Calvinist theologies, etc. I mean, anti-Catholicism anti -Catholicism can appear anywhere, but I think each nation's and each, um, well, each nation's, each religious group, <laughs> uh, writers from specific denominations have particular targets and um, theological concerns that they're hitting. Oh, so Heather, very similar question um, about, is there, are there any particular regional traditions and depictions of religion in the Gothic? So yeah, as I said, <laughs> um, it really does depend um, on, the, on the place and on the time. So one of the things I'm really keen to point out with my research is my research is very historically and geographically located. You can't just, you can't talk about um, the same there's not the same situation in other countries at other times. So they are all reacting to the specific theological, theopolitical circumstances. And we'll see that a little bit in a second. I'm going to talk about um, an example of an Irish uh, Gothic text and the way in which it's um, interacting with the specifics of um, Anglo-Irish and Catholic rapprochement at the end of the 18th century. Um, do, do, do. Was the Marquis de Sade in prison only for his writing or is there any truth in his reputation? Yes, he was in prison because he was a monster, basically. Um, so yes, there is truth in his uh, reputation um, in terms of uh, he, for example, imprisoned people um, and he was arrested and accused justifiably of forced sodomy, for example, um, uh, rape of children, adults, people. Uh, yeah, he's pretty monstrous as a guy, just generally. Um, so busy doing the Calvinism in Scotland, <laughs> so true. Oh, a good, we had a North Anger Abbey question already, so I've already thought this one out. So do you think it is then significant that Henry Tilney in North Anger Abbey is a responsible Anglican clergyman? part of Austin's sending up or overturning of Gothic tropes. So um, I'll talk a little bit, or I might come back to North Anger Abbey, remind me in the second chat, because I'm gonna talk about ruins and abbeys and stuff in the next part, um, in relation to sort of Colonel General Tilney, never remember, sorry. Um, but I think with Austin, you have, there's the potential that it's integrating here and creating this parody, certainly. Um, moving away from that monstrous clergy. But I think you also need to put Austin within the other context of the period. The fact that, you know, clergymen appear in quite a number of her works as romantic love interests. Um, so it's, I talked about in the first week, I talked about the idea of, of the Joan Forbes idea of the brother protector and of the unthreatening hero. And I think there's also definitely a part of that um, that's going into these Austin portrayals of uh, clerical heroes, as well as a specific relation to um, undermining Gothic tropes or a specific relation to um, the clergy. And also obviously in her family, uh, <laughs> you have sort of a biographical link there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions for now. Did I miss anybody? Just like, I don't know, wave or <laughs> um, pop a me in the chat. No? Okay. Ready for the second section. Um, it's not going to be as long, don't worry, but it is going to go in quite in depth. And I am going to be challenging quite a lot of the current readings. So it's going to be a bit history heavy. I'm going to be bringing my receipts, so hopefully you'll end up agreeing with me. We will see. Um, a ver, a ver. 
there we go. So, <laughs> um, just straight in there with that title, right? The problem with the anti-Catholicism argument. Basically, what am I saying? Um, so a lot of the way in which we've looked at these depictions of the Catholic and the Gothic have been reading it through this idea that the Gothic is anti-Catholic. Um, and there have been country readings that say it's pro-Catholic, but none of these readings really deal very well with the ambiguities of the text. And they also don't really reflect in a nuanced way um, the, the historical context and what's going on in this period. So I'm going to put, um, so that you can see them, some of the claims that are made in terms of um, arguing that the Gothic is anti-Catholic. I'm going to put some sort of counterclaims and context on the other side. So I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today. I'm probably talking for six hours. Um, so the first claim is that the Gordon riots, which I mentioned were in 1780, demonstrate a, the popular anti-Catholic feeling of the period throughout the period. So this is a common argument that I see again and again, but I think we can see the problem. The Gordon riots happened in 1780, and you don't have a similar set of riots, although you do, you do have minor riots um, or minor disturbances, but you don't have a similar set of riots again. But what you do have is an increasing context of tolerance, both for the Catholics and the Catholic Emancipation Acts of 1778, 1791, and 1829, and for dissenters. And I'll go back to that thought in a second. Um, there is this idea that the influx of immigrants in the French from the French Revolution increased the public rejection of Catholicism, and you have things such as the Aliens Act brought as evidence of that. But as I've already mentioned, you need to contextualize that Aliens Act in terms also of this fear of uh, radical Jacobinism, um, in terms of the sort of the more xenophobic aspect and uh, the arguments that are always uh, being put forward against increased immigrations. Um, and this counter argument that actually, um, and this is a fairly common argument among historians and church historians of the period, that the influx of immigrants and the persecution of the Catholic Church um, in the French Revolution arguably aided public perception. And I've got some quotes for you here from a couple of different works that talk about this. So Maria Purves, so she gives a pro-Catholic a pro reading of the Gothic, and I don't agree with her, but I think she's got some really interesting points to raise here. So she says that there's a counter-revolutionary discourse shaped by Edmund Burke, he of sublime fame, but um, she's talking about his reflections on the revolution in France. And she says that he, um, basically valorized the Catholics, gave these very um, sympathetic portrayals of the Catholic priests, for example, and he emphasized the sanctity and supremacy of adhering to the religious traditions of one's forefathers. So he emphasizes the sort of the Catholic figures as tragic figures, and he connects this to, you know, we have to um, respect our, our clergy, we have to respect um, these sort of engines of social order. But he also therefore connects the Anglican Church with its Catholic history and valorizes that Catholic history. Um, so as Clara Tweet notes, there's also this idea in the French Revolution that the cause of the Catholic Church was identified with the cause of the cause of all churches. So the primary threat wasn't Catholicism anymore. The primary threat was the primary threat was atheism, radical dissent, radical politics, and republicanism. On a more practical note, Douglas Newton in his study of the French émigrés in London notes that actually the behaviour of the clergy, um, which within the sight of so many of them about the London streets, did much at the critical time of the relief bills in the 1790s to break down prejudices as well as familiarise the public with Catholic services, chapels and ways of life. So the argument is basically in this period what you're seeing is a greater familiarity, a demystification of Catholicism rather than an increase in anti-Catholic rhetoric or anti-Catholicism per se. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, uh, just in case you haven't caught it, that these dates, if you look at those dates of Catholic emancipation, they map really quite clearly onto the period of the rise of the Gothic as well. It's a little bit of a coinkydink um, that toleration was spreading at the same time as the Gothic. And there's some arguments that the Gothic is a reaction to that, but I don't really think that we can see them um, as justified. Um, as the Gothic is this complete outlier to the dominant public discourse. Um, there's this idea that in the period 
um, as in the period of the Seven Years' War in the mid 18th century, there's a fear of French invasion, and that is specifically connected with a fear of Catholic invasion. Really problematic here, because of course, the current 1790s fear of French invasion, both literal and metaphorical, was about the fear of Jacobin principles, radicalism, um, and sort of this link to atheism and the dissenting radicals, excuse me, such as the Unitarians. So one of the most famous speeches in favor of the revolution was given by, um, is it Richard Price, who was a Presbyterian, for example. Um, there's also this other argument, which I still categorize as anti-Catholic, but which is quite interesting in the work of Alison Milbank. Um, and she notes that Anglicans um, are trying to provide justification for the connection between the Catholic and Anglican churches. Because the, as we've said before, Anglicanism is sort of Catholicism light. It's not a full rejection of Catholicism to move towards radical reformation theology and reform. Um, and so you have a double movement of critique and appropriation going on with the Catholic Church that's essentially rejecting the Catholic Church per se, but valorizing certain aspects of it, but critiquing most of it. But one thing to note here is that this argument doesn't really work or doesn't provide, I would say, a completely um, universal frame for investigating the depiction of the Catholic, because there were several stances within the Anglican Church in terms of the relation to the Catholic, and these were very rarely based on specifics of the Anglo-Catholic relation or Anglican-Catholic relations. The context of these discussions was more often the wider discourses of toleration, and those discourses of toleration were linked to the relationship between different Protestant denominations. So from the proliferation of different Protestant different, um, denominations that you really get in the 17th century and then continuing in the 18th century, one of the primary concerns of toleration discourse in classic works such as John Locke's essay on toleration is the, the Anglican church's attitude towards the toleration of dissenting groups. And there is a, there is a history, um, a, an overlapping history of Catholic oppression and emas emancipation and dissenting oppression and emancipation. And the rules against them were arising at very similar times. Um, and they were also be, becoming emancipated at very similar times. So we've already had a look at the Catholic side um, in terms of the repeal of anti-Catholic laws, you've got 1778, 1791, and 1829. And another key date is 1828, which was the removal of the Test and Corporations Act, which was the, um, the idea that you had to fulfill certain um, requirements before you gained a number of uh, specific civil, civil and political rights, including, for example, the ability to go to University of Oxford, Cambridge. Um, and those acts definitely affected the Catholics. But what you quite often find in Gothic criticism is, a, is an inquiry into them as though they only affected Catholics. But this is a much bigger issue. And the toleration debates and discussions which are going on in this period, during the, the period of the early British Gothic, they are never removed from these wider discussions of toleration related also to dissent. And some of those arguments are really focused on dissent. So you might have noticed that there's this big gap between 1791 and 1829 in terms of the expansion of emancipation. And this has been linked by some historians particularly to the idea that actually political toleration was set back by not fear of a Catholic, but by fear of the Unitarians and the radical dissenters. And extending rights to Catholics inevitably because of um, these, these people were affected by the same bills and laws, it would it essentially give more freedom to the Unitarians and the radical dissenters. And so you have somebody like Burke, for example, who is arguing for the expansion of Catholic emancipation, getting up in Parliament and denying the Unitarians the expansion of emancipation. Um, but you do have an increasing tolerance also. So this toleration debate is also um, opening the doors um, an increasing tolerance, not only to Catholics, but to dissenters. And you have things like the increase of ecumenical movements, such as the London Missionary Society, with Congregationalists, Presbys, Calvinist Methodists, and Evangelical Anglicans. You also are then getting the repeal of uh, discriminatory laws, which were specifically aimed at dissenters, such as the Five Mile Act and the Conventicles Act, which um, stopped dissenting preachers from preaching in different places. 
1813, you have the repeal of the Blasphemy Act. And the Blasphemy Act had um, was basically also discriminatory against Sicinians, for example, who denied the Trinity, because one of these acts of blasphemy was den denial of the Trinity. Um, it's amazing, isn't it, that you could get prosecuted for not believing in the tr Trinity pre-1813. Um, in 1828, that removal of the Testing Corporations Act also extended um, rights to dissenters and particularly Sassinians, so again, those who didn't believe in the Trinity, and Quakers who were refused to take oaths. So the context here for tolerance is much wider than Catholic emancipation. And so when we're depicting the Catholic and we are engaged with depictions of it as worthy or unworthy of toleration, for example, it's never only about Catholicism. No. Um, quoting myself again here, um, because throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, both dissenters and Catholics were targeted at various times for particular persecution. There's a shared history of oppression, and of increased toleration that makes it impossible to separate Catholic emancipation and the representation of the Catholic from a wider discourse of toleration more frequently found to be critical of an Anglican confessional state than supporting it. So this idea of an Anglican confessional state is when there's a, a complete unity between state and church. So the, there's a state church which is integrated in, with the government as well, which is what of course you find here. Um, and there are penal laws that reinforce that. So, for example, the blasphemy laws um, enforce particular beliefs upon the populace. So, what I'm going to argue is that anti-Catholicism and pro-Catholicism don't offer actually very good lenses for interpreting what's going on with the depiction of the Catholic. Of course, there are elements of, Catholic, of critique of Catholic doctrine, of the critique of the Catholicism as an institution. But that's not all that's going on. We're engaged here in a toleration debate. Um, and not just toleration of Catholics, but broader. And I just want to, to quickly um, differentiate between a couple of things and really be explicit about what I'm talking about here. So political toleration is the extension of toleration to all um, creeds, colors, um, and relig uh, races, religions, sexualities, etc., based on their rights as citizens. Um, theopolitical toleration is the um, toleration of different, excuse me, theological groups um, based on sort of a theological understanding. So it's an extension of theological as well as political rights. So basically, it's this idea of, um, well, you're, you're included too. You're a Christian too. Um, it's grounded in a theological tolerance. So theological tolerance has to be extended first. You're not a heretic, you're not an outsider, you're not damned, you're not um, outside the pale. Um, and because of that theological tolerance, you can then have theopolitical toleration. And theopolitical toleration is very clearly what we see argued for in the Gothic. So is the Gothic pro or anti-toleration generally? And obviously each text is gonna be different here, guys. Um, we can't make rules that apply to everything. Well, yes, I would say it is quite pro-toleration. And this is very, very overt in a couple of texts, in quite a number of texts, actually. So one of those is Charles Lucas's The, Ca the Castle of St. Donuts, uh, otherwise known as The History of Jack Smith, otherwise known as Naked Pirate Battles. Um, and if you may remember, you may not, that um, our hero's father was a French duke who lived down a well for 25 years. And when he pops up out of his well, he says, though I was brought up in the Roman Catholic faith, since I came to the years of mature judgment, I have made a profession of none other but the Christian. I abhor all separating names of sectaries in distinction. I'm neither of Paul or Apollos or of Cephas, but Christ. Luther or Calvin, Wesley or Priestley, Papist, Protestant or dissenter are nothing to me. So he's arguing here for a radical form of theological tolerance based upon which is the theopolitical toleration that extends that he in, in expects to extend to him. So this is very overt and you find similar overt pronouncements in texts like the Libertines, the Abbess, and also um, the English Nun by Catherine Selden, for example. But sometimes it's slightly less overt, but still there. 
And we have to look outside, really, the veil of Gothic criticism to understand how we can identify a pro-toleration text. So Irene Bostrom wrote an article called The Novel and Catholic Emancipation, which is pretty great. Um, she actually says that the Gothic is a, isn't one of these pro-toleration discourses, <laughs> but the paradigm that she offers for interpreting it, we do find in the Gothic all over the place. So um, she says that how do we spot a pro-toleration text? Well, the characters will be balanced quite obviously, meaning if you've got only Catholics, there'll be good Catholics and bad Catholics. If you've got Catholics and Protestants or um, Methodists and Anglicans, there'll be a good Anglican and a good Methodist, a good Catholic and a good Protestant. So ca characters are balanced. And thereby you're getting this differentiation between the individual and the institution. So a Catholic is not just an avatar of the Catholic Church. Catholics are individuals. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are damned, some of them are not. Their denominational allegiance does not determine their spiritual state. So do we see this in the Gothic? Yields. I said earlier that I would come back to the Italian and the two convents, and I just am now. So you have the bad convent, San Stefano, where Elena is imprisoned, and the good convent, La Pieta, where she finds sanctuary, um, and who the nuns of whom have helped her throughout her life. And there's also a differentiation between the abbesses. The abbess of San Stefano is motivated by greed and hypocrisy. The abbess of La Pieta by a sort of extensive tolerance. So there's some critiques of the Italian that suggest that the abbess of La Pieta is basically a Protestant in disguise because she's not that rigorous about Catholic um, manifestations of uh, worship or she's not that invested in the rigors basically but I would say well she isn't a protestantized catholic she very clearly engages in specifically catholic rituals of worship for example and such as telling the beads praying to different saints or the virgin but what we find here is a form of tolerant catholicism now super nerdy moment here and I don't know if anyone will pick up on this all day <laughs> but um, Radcliffe is representing a very specific form of theological toleration um, and you have to differentiate here between toleration and comprehension. So toleration is the idea, if you're thinking of it on a governmental level that's a little bit easier, um, this idea that everybody has the same rights regardless of denomination. Comprehension is the idea that there should be one state church for example but that the gate should be wide. Um, so that many people can get in, so that you're tolerant of other people having different practices or different beliefs within the same church body. And that idea is what we find in La Pieta. It's a, it's a novel which forwards a toleration narrative which is all about comprehension. She provides this safe, open, welcoming space, which isn't rigorous as to specific beliefs. There's a clear ambiguity in the Italian um, which I think this pro-toleration discourse enables us to understand and isn't really understandable through an anti-Catholic anti lens. Similarly, um, another sort of contested site of this is the, is the Abbey. Um, so there's some really, really good work on this already. I'm not saying anything new. And before I get to the example, I'm going to talk more generally. So you often have ruined abbeys in the Gothic. Sometimes they're sites of fear. But often they're sort of sites that induce sacred wonder in um, the protagonists wandering around them. And as critics such as Dale Townsend, Alison Milbank again have noted, what you're getting here um, is a reflection of a late 18th and early 19th century reassessment of the Reformation and particularly the desolation of the monasteries. This sort of reassessment of the uh, move to Anglicanism and this re-evaluation or revaluation of the Catholic past. So you're getting that double movement of critique of the excesses of monkish superstition, for example, and appropriation of the good, the aesthetic um, worship practices, for example, the attainment of the sublime. Um, the example, though, that I'm going to talk about briefly is very specific. And Jarlith Killeen relates it to the specific theopolitical context of Anglo-Irish, Anglican, Catholic rapprochement in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, where um, the Anglo-Irish Anglicans and the Irish Catholics were attempting to create sort of more of an alliance in the face of Britain's increasingly autocratic and colonialist policies. 
um, which by this point uh, was including the Anglo-Irish as simply Irish, um, including them sort of under this colonialist yoke, basically. Um, and so we can look at the example of Regina Marie Roche's The Children of the Abbey. Again, a terror gothic, the heroine Amanda is running from constant persecution. And she ends up in, an, in a convent, taking refuge in a convent, which is described as a long, low building encompassed by the ruins of a formerly wealthy abbey. Now, this abbey is itself valued. When she's walking around it, she experiences sacred awe. And there's also a positive rendering of the convent. The nuns are truly devout, they're truly kind, they're truly helpful. It's a place of sanctuary and refreshment and relief. Uh, one of the only ones in the entire novel. So you have both of these places as positively coded and they interrelate to each other as well. There's a sense of a valorization of a Catholic past and a valorization of the possibilities of the Catholic present. But it also visually represents the conditions necessary for this Anglo-Irish rapprochement with the Catholicism, which is basically the diminished power of the Catholic Church as an institution. So there's a theological or theologically tolerant um, re-evaluation of the Catholic here, but it's grounded upon the sort of gutting out of Catholicism as an institution with dangerous political and societal power. Um, so that's one way to recognize a pro-toleration text. Canwell gives us another way, and it might be Mark Canwell, I keep forgetting to check, uh, but Canwell, there you go. Um, and he notes something that may appear at first to be quite contradictory, but that he notes that actually these depictions of the, the repressive measures of the Inquisition and oppressive monastic spaces of the Gothic aren't just about Catholicism. They actually represent a, a suspicion towards and rejection of a persecuting confessional state. So remember, confessional state is that interrelation of the state and church together. Um, um, so basically, he's saying that these depictions of a monstrous Catholicism as an agent of oppression are actually a critique of a confessional state. In other words, a critique of the Anglican confessional state, which conversely means that it's advocating tolerance for Catholicism at the same time as displaying monstrosity. So it's a bit of a double movement there. But we certainly do find it within the Gothic, both explicitly and implicitly. I'm going to give you two examples. A really obvious go-to example is William Godwin's depiction of the Inquisition. All uh, depictions of the Inquisition, arguably, but William Godwin makes it very, very explicit. When he depicts the Inquisition in St. Leon, he goes on to um, say just before this quote he says well if it wasn't the catholics it would be the protestants it would be the levelers it would be the ranters it would be somebody would be doing this because the problem is the relationship of church and state and he asked that question why had providence thought proper to generate alliance between church and state and to place the power and authority of human society in the hands of the adherents of the christian faith the problem here is a persecuting confessional state and so he's actually advocating for toleration, a toleration which reflects back on the Catholicism which he is displaying as monstrous. Another very helpfully clear example of this, and of all the tropes I've talked about of pro-toleration narratives, is Matthew Lewis's Venoni, which is a play from 1806. Don't really need to go over the plot with you, pretty basic, pretty standard. Uh, two young things are persecuted by a monk, imprisoned, etc., etc., etc. Um, but you do have this differentiation between individual and institution, this good monk, bad monk thing. So Celestino is the bad persecuting monk and Michael is the good rescuing monk. And you also have this depiction of a monastic monstrosity of this imprisonment and oppression with a very, very overt toleration discourse. In fact, the title of this side, Be Tolerant, is what is shouted off the stage right at the end of the play. Those are the last words of the play. And as you can see, the last two speeches of the play are both speeches after we've had all of this monastic trauma, which advocate for theological tolerance and through it, theopolitical toleration. So Father Michael says that we shouldn't confuse the habit with the heart. Um, that 
not all Catholics are the same, basically. And Benoni goes on even more clearly to say, let us scorn to bow beneath the force of vulgar prejudice and fall to our hearts as brethren in one large embrace, men of all ranks, all faiths, and all professions. So hopefully you can see how this works um, in this very, very clear example here. But you can use this sort of discourse to in interrogate lots of different Gothic nar narratives. So we've looked at the ways in which these depictions of Catholicism can reflect back on the Anglican church and the Anglican confessional state. But there's also a sense in which these depictions of the Catholic can also represent a commentary on enthusiastic dissent. So stuff like Methodism. Um, it's worth noting that we quite often, when we see the word superstition in the Gothic, we think, oh, Catholic, it's Catholic coded. But it's worth noting, and here I'm going back to Hume, uh, David Hume and his differentiation between superstition and enthusiasm. He differentiates between these two models as types of religion. So Catholicism isn't superstition, Catholicism is superstitious, but also according to his definition, arguably the Anglican church could be considered as superstitious. Hmm. What is his definition of superstition? It's this idea that it's the roots of it are weakness, fear, melancholy, together with ignorance. And that leaves you open to uh, hierarchical and authoritarian structures and manipulation by those above you by priests, etc. So at the bottom, he says, the stronger mixture there is of superstition, the higher is the authority of the priesthood. He also differentiates another type of religion, and that is enthusiasm. If you look at the bottom of the quote, he says that hope, pride, presumption, and a warm imagination together with ignorance are the forces of enthusiasm. Religions, he's suggesting like Methodism, which start with this emphasis on personal revelation, um, and this idea that you have privileged access to knowledge and divine, uh, the divine will. But something that's interesting that we find in Hume is his argument that enthusiasm inevitably becomes superstition. They're sort of two sides of the same coin, um, points in the journey. You also find this in works such as Bishop George Lavington's The Enthusiasm of the Methodists and Papists, which is three whole volumes long. So he goes into quite a lot of detail and I had to read every single one of them. Um, so you are getting this conflation and we can see it busily represented here in William Hogarth's etching of enthusiasm delineated. If you haven't looked at this before, go check it out on the internet. It's a fabulous picture and there's so many details. One of my favourites just at the front there on the floor, that's Mary Toft, I believe, giving birth to some rabbits. So that was one of the miracles that um, a particular dissenter uh, decided to use as proof um, in the late 17th century, I think. But the point of interest here is the top of the picture where you can see the sort of Wesleyan minister with his wig and it's flipping back and revealing a monkish tonsure. Um, so it's revealing kind of this parity between the Catholic and the enthusiastic, between the Catholic and Protestant descent. And we can see this very clearly um, in the Gothic in the Libertines. So Father Jerome is, of course, the baddie. Evil, 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 evil all the way through. And then, flippity-flop, he leaves the Catholic Church and studies the religious principles of Luther. He becomes a Lutheran. And you're like, oh, okay, fine. He's repented, he's reflected, he's changed. It's all going to end happily. But no. He begins a field mission, which ties this more clearly to Methodism, I would argue. Um, but he starts again with his Catholic traits, those things which belong to his Catholicism, but aren't exclusive to them. He has manipulative methods of religious control. He forces his illiterate followers to sign a recantation of their Catholic beliefs, a sign that they, that they couldn't have read, obviously. Eventually, you know, he's brought them all into perdition, but happily for us, he himself ends up burnt as a heretic fairly gruesome deets. <laughs> so look out for that if you're following the read along. Um, so the last slide for this section is very brief because I had quite a few questions about Jewish identity last uh, week. Now the disclaimer I wish to emphasize it is not my principal field of expertise and so these are just some thoughts that I've had about the representation here and how it ties in with these ideas of toleration for example. 
basically not much <laughs> is the answer. So I'm thinking about Jewish emancipation, anti-Semitism and the Gothic. And something that's been coming out a lot in the discussions today is the way in which potentially um, the, a, a more aware and intricate depiction of Jewish identity and overlap with this arguments about Jewish emancipation is occurring more in the 19th century because you don't have Jewish emancipation on the table or being fulfilled until 1858 in England. Um, there are a couple of stock Jewish figures and they're fairly related to anti-Semitic tropes. So one of them is the hidden converso. You find, for example, in Melmoth the Wanderer. Um, a converso, of course, is from the um, Spanish and it is the idea of a Jew who was converted or forcibly converted to Christianity. And in these tropes that we find in Melmoth the Wanderer, for example, in St. Leon, the converso is usually deceitful. They're not really converted. So you have this sort of anti-Semitic uh, rhetoric of the deceitful Jew. And it's often also associated with a mercantile identity. Um, and that sort of uh, anti-Semitic trait of the avaricious usurer. Um, but as I've mentioned at the bottom here, there's, there is some sort of tension going on, um, although it's perhaps not self-interrogating a sympathy and a scorn. So in A Melm of the Wonder, for example, you have this fairly standardly anti-Semitic depiction of a hidden converso that um, it gets forced to help our protagonist. But then he goes under the city and ends up staying with an older Jewish man who is writing out the history of Melmoth. And he is a sort of place of security and also of um, wisdom and guidance. So there is this this tension I think occurring and you find something similar with the wandering Jew. So the wandering Jew is a trope is anti-Semitic, um, particularly, well, it became anti-Semitic um, in the sort of middle ages, early modern period, as it arose into prominence in the German tradition where the identity of the wanderer was solidified as Jewish because in the original stories, um, it wasn't necessarily Jewish. Some of them were Roman, it was a Roman figure, but it was somebody who, um, wouldn't help Jesus on the cross, as I mentioned last week, and so gets punished with an eternal life of wandering and having to eternally witness to Christ's death and resurrection. So you have the wandering Jew, but within the English context, and particularly I think in the way he turns up in books like Mammoth the Wanderer or um, The Monk, for example, and certainly in the romantic poetry of people like Percy Shelley, Often this Jewish, Jewish content or Jewish context has been removed to some extent. So this idea of the wandering Jew as the figure that is sort of like the avatar of the punishment of all the Jews in this anti-Semitic discourse is fading away. Um, and the wandering Jew, particularly in the Romantic tradition, becomes this kind of overreaching, um, rebellious figure, particularly in Percy Shelley, who is complaining about God's arbitrary uh, ire and wrath. So a bit of a mix, I would say, going on. In terms of the depiction of Muslim identity, you do find that, and you find two specific trends, I would say. Um, in Robert Sully's Talaba the Destroyer, which is a quest narrative about young Talaba who has to go and destroy witchcraft and stuff, uh, you get the Protestantized Muslim. So I've complained about the Protestantized Catholic narrative, but I think you do find that in To Lover because it's not only the quest is, is framed in very Protestant terms, but also um, he speaks often in biblical paraphrases. You also have, for example, in William Beckford, the, um, an exoticization, emphasis on exoticization, transgression and Orientalism. So very minimal, almost non-existent engagement with the complexities of actual Islamic theology. Um, you do have potentially this relatively positive, positive rendering because there are sort of orthodoxly Islamic characters in the text and they offer a nebulous religious orthodoxy in contrast to the iniquitous identity of Vathek and his mother, for example. So a bit on the edge. Anyway, as I said, not my primary field of expertise, but I wanted to just say a little bit about it. Um, um, hopefully it's just a, a thought starter for people, really. So, break time, <laughs> confess your questions. So, quite information heavy. 
Um, hopefully I didn't lose anyone. Um, do you have any questions? Don't worry, the last section is super short. Oh, one thing, I did say I would go back to it in the last question time about Northanger Abbey. Um, I talked very, very briefly about the way in which um, there's this discourse at the end of the 18th, early 19th century, which is reassessing the desolation of the monasteries. And part of that is about reassessing the people who then inherited or bought those properties. And so the fact that Tilney owns an abbey is actually sort of a black mark against his character within that discourse, just for your information. This might be for part three, but is there a point where you start seeing more religious characters, protagonist romantic interests, hot priests? <laughs> um, I'm not talking about that in part three, no. <laughs> I think in the early British Gothic, um, most of the interactions with religious figures are often quite tormented and dark. But I think within that, you have the roots of the hot priest. You have the anti-heroic character and complexity. So for example, somebody like Scudoni is arguably really the protagonist of the novel, not the bland, bland, blandness of Elena and Vivaldi. Scudoni is really the most intriguing character, the heart of the novel. Um, and so even though he's evil, you're well on the way to this kind of anti-heroic um, discourse, I would say. I don't know if you know, oh, this might be off topic, but how did the revolutions affect the Gothic? I know, super general. Oh my gosh, that is super general. Um, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so the American one, you're not seeing the influence of the American revolution on the Gothic so much because um, it's predating the, the real efflorescence of the Gothic in the 1790s. But certainly that spirit of republicanism is impacting the Gothic. What you find, I think, in um, sort of the, the 80s and early 90s is this optimism among radical dissenters, um, uh, some of whom were Gothic writers, about the possibilities of republicanism and reform and this rejection of tyranny, for example. But then, particularly with the increase of the terror in 1793 to 4, you find a reversal and this sort of terror of the mob, um, this terror of the, the, the results of the fall of order and societal structure. So this is particularly evident in a novel like The Monk, um, or is it Melmoth the Wanderer? Which one is it? Uh, no, it's the monk where they're like, um, and, and Melmoth the Wanderer, where basically um, a clerical figure gets ripped apart by a mob. So you have this kind of conjunction of fears appearing um, in terms of how the French Revolution enters the consciousness of the Gothic. Do, 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 do. Okay. Um, I don't know if you know, but is there possibly a connection with the losing of Jewishness to the wandering Jew and becoming an overreach with the rise of Christian specific Kabbalism? I, I don't know, but as I said um, in the sort of the morning session or the afternoon session, I think this is really a question. I'm fairly sure that Maz Goering is working on that. So Maz Going, sorry, is working on that. So it's definitely worth uh, seeing if you can contact her and asking. Um, because it's, n it's not something that I know about, but I'm fairly sure that she does. Um, Christian appropriated capitalism. Are there overtly loop, atheist characters in these early gothics? Or are the only villains people who practice a faith but evilly? Oh no, loads of atheists. So like, um, I've been looking really at these kind of depictions of a monstrous or gothic faith, but there's also theologically relatively conservative novels such as those of Anne Radcliffe. Um, and in those novels, you certainly do find um, there's uh, that most of the evil characters are atheistical. 
and refuse belief. So people like the Marquis de Montalt, um, Montoni, are explicitly atheistic. So yeah, um, there's definitely that, that fear of uh, the monstrosity of atheism. Definitely is an issue in the Gothic. Um, so, sorry, I just turned your phone off because I think it was just feedback, but I'm not sure there. But if you want to specify any addition to the question, do feel free. Um, do you think the imprisonment in cloisters and dark passages reflects the claustrophobic state of, the mo of most characters within, such as Ambrosia and the monk having never left the abbey walls, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think there's this, um, there's this continual emphasis on claustrophobia within the Gothic. And part of that, in a more general sense, is often a reflection on kind of gender um, imprisonment and claustrophobia and the sort of the narrow world of the female protagonist. So it's not a stretch to suggest that, yes, um, this emphasis on kind of conventual claustrophobia is an echo of that kind of the narrow and reduced lives. Um, that are being depicted in that kind of monastic isolationism, I would say, yeah. Um, are there any or many instances of the clergy displaying divine powers of some sort? We've seen a lot of demonic powers so far, but what about the opposite? Hmm, that's a great question. And I will have to think about it and get back to you on it, because nothing's coming right off the top of my head. Um, but I think that's a fascinating question. Yeah, I'll definitely have a look at it. There are some good clergy, um, but they don't have divine powers in the ones that I'm thinking of, such as The Romance of the Forest um, by Anne Radcliffe. Hmm. Yes, interesting. It feels a bit overt for the early British Gothic, um, but I'll have a look and see if I can think of any examples. Thank you for the question. Are there any more questions at this stage? Okay, I'm going to go on to the final section. And as you can see, it's going to be fast. <laughs> um, basically, what I'm going over in the last section are some of the more general ways in which the Gothic looks at monstrous religion and Gothic faith. Now, a lot of these I've discussed in previous classes, which is why we can go through them quite quickly. But do obviously feel free to ask questions. And I might run a minute or two over. So if you need to leave, no shame, run. Um, but don't worry about the chat shutting down as well. I think it's going to, I've got another 15 minutes. Um, so don't worry about that. Okay, last one. So I'm going to take you briefly through my answer to this question. Is the Gothic always, is Gothic faith always monstrous? A Gothic text always atheist text or heretic text? Certainly not. Um, you have more orthodox texts, as I just mentioned, such as the work of Anne Radcliffe. Um, but what I'm talking about are these monstrous texts, these atheist texts, these heretic texts. And I'm going to look at a few ways in which the Gothic investigates a conception of monstrous religion. So starting at the beginning, as usual, looking at Horace Walpole. And we have this um, sense in the Castle of Otranto of a providential narrative. It's all connected. Everything that happens is connected to this providential moral that you know, God is looking out and he will make sure that the wrongdoer is punished to the third and the fourth generation. But of course, in this text, that becomes fairly monstrous. You've got this monstrous success in terms of the supernatural, the, the giant helmet, things which are completely um, separate from any established Catholic framework of understanding of the supernatural. And this monstrous success is connected to a monstrous punishment, a punishment far beyond the crimes and a punishment which affects the innocent. Conrad hasn't done anything and he's crushed by a helmet. Matilda is stabbed by her own father for being too saintly. Um, and you have the destruction of the castle. And eventually the, the, the true heir just inherits a lifetime of misery. So you have this sense of a monstrous excess of the supernatural and a monstrous punishment connected to this providential narrative. And it makes that providential narrative monstrous itself. Now there's a very overt querying of this moral and this providential narrative in the preface to the first edition where Walpole says, I mean, is it really a deterrent? This just doesn't seem like a great idea. And in critiquing the idea of inherited sin, um, this idea that you punished for the sins of your fathers, there's also an inherent critique here of original sin and total depravity. We have to remember that Horace Walpole was basically 
an atheistical writer. So another idea of the monstrous religion in the Gothic is the idea of a monstrous divinity. And we find that particularly in the works of William Godwin. So William Godwin um, was raised in a sort of Calvinist background, a very strict Calvinist background, but became, he rejected his religion later in life and obviously became quite a radical political um, and social thinker. In Caleb Williams, which you can see in the picture, the servant discovers the master's secret. He opens a box and discovers the truth. And for that, he in, then enters into a life of unending pursuit and unending punishment by this sort of master God who is always there, always pursuing, always tormenting. And so you have this flipped narrative of that kind of Psalms promise of, you know, well, where can I run from my God? Nowhere. I can never escape from him and I can never escape from his care. But here you have, I can never escape from his torment. And this, monst this monstrous divinity that's depicted here. Um, and, and in William Godwin's own sort of theological or atheological writings, he talks about the monstrosity of God as depicted in the Bible multiple times. You also have a similar motif in St. Leon, that narrative I talked about where the guy gets the um, elixir vitae and becomes immortal. And he himself compares his immortality with divinity, saying, you know, we're both different now. I'm like God because I've eaten of the tree of life and of the tree of knowledge. And God said in Regenesis, if you eat of both, then you'll become like me. And I have, I've become like him. But there's this idea of the inherent inhumanity of that immortality and its inherent monstrosity, which is really underlined by St. Leon's wife, who says, how unhappy the wretch, the monster, rather, let me say, who is without an equal. So you, here there's an obvious comment on St. Leon, but it reflects back on this, on the divinity as well. He who is without equal, is so inhuman as to be monstrous. This one we've talked about um, last week particularly, and the idea of a graceless God in novels like The Monk, where you have this exclusive emphasis on the terror sublime, entering accidentally into that sort of accidental Burkean heresy where the sublime and the Old Testament God gets separated from the beautiful and the New Testament God of Ray, uh, wraith of, of mercy so you're left with an old testament god of wrath and you end up essentially demonizing the divine there's also a connected critique as i discussed last week um, of determinism and the idea of the devil's ability to act outside of god's plan and therefore you also have a, con a questioning of theodicy and the origin of evil um, I've not really talked about Frankenstein, but it's an obvious example here of the, the note of or interrogation of God as a fearsome father. The epigraph to Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus is, of course, did I request thee maker from my clay to mold me man, which is a quote from Paradise Lost. And you have within the text these multiple kind of representations of the characters of Frankenstein as the creature and the creature as sort of Adamic figures, as God figures, as Satan figures, and in the case of the creature as an Eve figure. But the, the clearest one there is the idea of Frankenstein as the God to his creatures, Adam, and he is a monstrous God. So there's this critique also of the, um, of the, the fatherly narrative about God. Uh, the last one, we talked about this again last week, this idea of demonic doctrines. Um, and you find this particularly in the Scottish Gothic and um, critiques of uh, Calvinist extremity. So in this text, we had the demonic double. So George Ringham uh, has his demonic double, Gil Martin. And there's this idea, of course, of that inherent duality. But there's also a rejection of his theological principles, which is this antinomian heresy that, well, he's elect. He's chosen to be saved, so he can't do anything to change that. So he can do anything he likes. So yes, that's it. Some of the ideas of monstrous religion and Gothic faith that get explored in the Gothic. And as I say, I'm very happy to answer questions about any of those. Um, so time to test my faith, your faith in me. <laughs> so um, there you go. That's brought us right to the hour. Um, so I will say goodbye if you want to leave, but I'll also leave it open for questions now for anybody who wants to stay. And if you want to stay, do feel free to ask a question via video if you don't mind being on the YouTube um, recording. And just so you know. So does anybody have any questions?
Does the creation of the vampire and vampires being evil because they are unlike any other? Um, I'm going to talk about the vampire in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to look at the theological roots of the vampire. I think there's definitely a theological element to the conception of the vampire in the 18th century, and particularly this idea of the vampire as an, an embodied immortality trapped in the flesh, trapped inherently in the corrupted flesh. Um, but as I say, I'll talk about that um, in more detail in a couple of weeks. I don't want to give too many spoilers right now. Any other questions? Do you think this monstrous divine thing is a kind of early, early precursor to cosmic horror? Ooh, super exciting. Um, sort of yes and sort of no. So I think they are actually, in a sense, diametrically opposed because this idea of monstrous divinity and monstrous theology is engaging with the Christian structures and frameworks of interpretation, querying them and challenging them. What you find in cosmic horror is an emptying out of those frameworks and a complete rejection of their use. They, they simply don't work or fit or do anything to help us understand this unknowable universe. So I've, I've got a paper on it that I've not published, I've just got it written around the house. Um, but what we find in cosmic horror texts is this deliberate dismantlement of religious structures, I think. Um, and sort of like pre-Christian beliefs, uh, the, the Lovecraftian kind of cosmologies and stuff like that. That's what I would say. To what extent does the exorcism subgenre of horror film pick up on or diverge from early Catholics' portrayal of Catholicism? Is it a fairly separate way of interrogating Catholicism? I think it's a really interesting different trend. And I think that the rise of Catholicism as the tool with which we fight evil is a separate tradition which you can find rooted in the 19th century and particularly something like Dracula, you know, where these sort of Catholic symbols become the way that you fight against the demonic other. Um, I think it's, it's a source of endless interest to me that it's always the Catholic church who has this power over the demonic, for example. Um, and I think it is, it's, it's engaging with a different tradition. I think it, it must be, but there's something in there about this interest in Catholic ritual and the power of Catholic ritual, which you do find in a different sense in the late 18th century. So the Catholic ritual, which is valorized in the 18th century, these kind of worship rituals and these sublime, the sublimity of Catholic worship, for example. But you do have then in these kind of exorcism texts, this interest in the Catholic rituals of, of exorcism and the sort of the power of this, this ritual. So I think there is this interesting connection, but yeah, um, and yeah, you're right. So um, it's interesting that it's the symbols, but you don't have to be Catholic to use them. So there is this sort of definitely like weird differentiation between belief and the symbology of it. But then there's also, um, you've got the flip side of that with narratives like I am legend or well, I Am Legend's a really good example of it because symbols only have power if you believe in them in I Am Legend. So like Christian vampires respond to crosses, Jewish vampires respond to the Torah, for example. So you do have uh, both things going on, I think. But it's, it, as I say, it's, as I always say, 20th century is not my area of expertise in terms of horror. I, it's something that's always interested me um, because you don't find many sort of... Um, Protestant narratives. You don't find many Anglican exorcists bobbing around in horror films. So yeah, it's interesting to me. Are there any other questions? Jewish vampires? Sounds exciting. Yes, well, I mean, within I Am Legend, um, it's, it's, a, it's very clearly sort of a, a, an infection of the infectious variety. It's not like a, a metaphorical infection, it's a literal infection. Um, and everybody becomes a vampire, but like his, the next door neighbor of the protagonist laughs at his cross. Um, and it uh, becomes evident that it's, it's the symbol that you believe in that is um, the one that functions for you. Oh, a rabbi who'd done an exorcism. Interesting. I've never seen a film, but then I don't watch as much horror as I could do. I've never seen a film that has a rabbi doing an exorcism. I don't know if they, if they do that, if there is one. 
be interesting to see. Much of King's work focuses on the belief of the innocent being able to recognize and defeat evil. King, Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Yes, interesting. I have to think more about Stephen King because I try not to read Stephen King, I'm afraid, because I don't really like him. Sorry, I'm a terrible horror scholar, but yes. Is there a connection between Catholicism and the Gothic in decadence? Yes, there is. Um, so it's an aesthetic connection is the one that immediately springs to mind. Um, and that sort of valorization of uh, Catholic iconography, etc., uh, rituals of worship, um, become something that is then aesthetically valorized also within the decadent period, um, uh, but usually disassociated from its religious and theological um, meaning per se, but just as a sort of point of access to the numinous or the transcendent or the beautiful. Um, you find that with somebody like Horace Walpole as well, who is sort of an affirmed atheist really, but he's very, very interested, almost obsessed with Catholic iconography. Kong's work. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, anyone else has a question? The only work by King that I like is Misery. Sorry. I think it's got some great psychological tension. The rest of them I don't really get. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming along. If everybody's finished with questions, do feel free to say hi with your microphones on. Well, goodbye with your microphones on quickly. Um, and thanks very much. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for all the information. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, yeah. Um, if you uh want to chat to me or you want to find any of the resources that i'm putting up or you want to find my kofi link then you can find me on the twitters as usual at rom goth sam um, i'm also on facebook but i don't really use it to be honest <laughs> um uh, but i do use twitter all the time as you will have noticed um, i'm glad you enjoyed it as i say very content heavy today so if there's stuff that you want to go away and think about and then be like wait a second i disagree <laughs> then do feel free to do that um and yes, thank you very much for coming.